Coming in October, an all-new 365-day prayer devotional from Sarah Young. Scripture-based daily prayers to bring you closer to Him. Free sample at JesusCalling.com. This episode contains domestic abuse content and suicidal thoughts that may be disturbing for some listeners. You have not just a right, but a responsibility to yourself and to who God made you to set boundaries with people who do not respect you or treat you with dignity. And that goes not just in spousal relationships, that's also in friendships, it's with coworkers, it's with other family members. You are not just allowed to set boundaries, you have a right to do it. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. When we find ourselves in a difficult season of our lives, we may ask ourselves the question, how did I get here? And when we aren't able to figure it out right away, we may turn on ourselves for the blame, bringing on deep feelings of regret and shame. Psalm 145 reminds us that when we seek the Lord, He will answer us and deliver us from all our fears. It also says, those who look to Him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. Our guests this week dealt with really tough circumstances, ones that caused them to question deeply who they were and where they would end up. CNN anchor Christy Paul dealt with an abusive spouse and didn't know where to turn until she was at the end of her rope and a verse from Proverbs brought her hope that she could trust God to find a way out. Travel blogger Gloatonmo was in another country when she became very ill and had to have major surgery that set her back for months. As she wondered how she would recover physically, emotionally, and financially, a caring nurse gave her a copy of Jesus Calling, where she was able to find a bit of hope to see beyond the place where she was in. We'll start off with Christy's story. My name is Christy Paul. I am an anchor for CNN New Day Weekend. I'm a mom, a wife, and we live in Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up in Bellevue, Ohio, which is a tiny little town smack between Toledo and Cleveland. And my dad was an attorney. My mom was a teacher. I have one brother who's six years younger than me. And I would not change a thing about where I grew up. I mean, it was rural Ohio. And I had some of the best friends. I grew up with my family, my extended family, cousins, aunts, uncles. We were always together. And it does give you, I think, growing up a real sense of security to have all of that family and all of those friends around you. My parents displayed a beautiful marriage all my life. I mean, they would have the typical fights here and there, as all parents do. But there was nobody in my family who had been divorced, aunts, uncles, cousins, extended. I really had exceptional relationship examples growing up. I dated a guy my sophomore year who had kind of a Jekyll and Hyde personality. He could be very good to me, but he cheated on me and he could be manipulative. And he did slap me across the face once in the middle of the hallway at school. And I remember that humiliation. And I said, I would never allow that to happen to me again. And then I went and married somebody who did even worse. And it was one of those things where you think, how did I get here? You really start to question who you are and what brought you there and how you allowed it to happen. I don't know about other people, but I know for myself, I would look inward and I would blame me first. I had just started my first job in TV in West Virginia, and my co-anchor and I started dating, and I saw him as somebody who had so much charisma and confidence, and he was funny and he was smart, and he embraced me. I think he gave me a sense of, of strength because I saw such confidence in him and boldness in him, I wanted to be that. And I, deep down inside, did not feel that I was. So I feel like, in retrospect, I was kind of 
living vicariously through his confidence. And so when he proposed, I said yes. And a week later, the dream job I wanted, WKYC in Cleveland, called me. And it was a huge jump in market size at the time. They were in the top 15 at the time. And I went and told him, and I was so excited. And he said, well, you know, if you're going to take it, fine, but you're going without me. Because I already accepted a job in Boise, Idaho. And I'm not going with you. And blah, 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 blah. And is this what you want? When my fiancé gave me an ultimatum, I think I thought I was doing the noble thing because I was choosing the person and the love over the money, the career. So I just thought I was, I thought I was doing the right thing. So I followed him and it started pretty early. I mean, there were things that happened, the yelling, the screaming, the punching of walls, the threats before we even got married. And I I can look back and go, why did I do that? I've learned to be forgiving of myself, but it took me a lot of years to get there. I was thousands of miles away from anybody that I knew. I knew nobody in Boise at the time. So when they talk about abusers, it was really the perfect storm because I came into the relationship out of some really heavy emotional stuff that was going on already. And now the only person I have is him. It's the isolation that they talk about. Abusers will try to isolate you. If something happened and I wanted to go home to see my parents and he looked at me and he said, I'm your family now. You don't need to be going home every time you're hurt about something. The night that got really bad, he was yelling at me and telling me that I didn't love him. He came home drunk and he threw his wedding ring at me and he said, I don't even want to be married to you. I'm sorry I ever did it. I'm leaving. And he threw me up against the wall and he put his hand around my throat and he said, I'm going to bash your head into this wall. And then he punched the wall right next to me, you know, close enough to my head that I could feel the, you know, swoosh of the fist and then heard obviously the crash of it into the wall. And then he just stood there and looked at me and he didn't say anything, but he looked at me as if he was trying to say, I missed this time. I won't miss again. At some point I called a friend of mine in Boise. And I told her what happened, and I told her I was scared, and I asked her if I could come to her house. And she talked me out of it. She was somebody that worked with both of us. She had the best of intentions, I know. I think she didn't know what to do. I don't blame her. People don't know what to do in those situations sometimes. So I stayed. And then we moved to Phoenix, and I thought, okay, maybe this will be a new start. Maybe this will be okay. And the same kind of things kept happening. The manipulation. One night, it it all just blew up and he was screaming and he said he was going to leave. And it was the first time I didn't try to stop him. And then it really blew up. And he did leave. Yes, I was reeling, but there was a wave of relief. So when he got home, I left. I didn't leave for good. I just said, I need to get away from this for a minute. I went and sat in a church parking lot in Phoenix. And I sobbed and I prayed. And I said, God, I just don't know what you want me to do. And Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. (sighs) I went, okay. You know, follow him and I will direct your paths. Give it to me, Christy. I think the hardest part of being in a relationship like that is determining whether you're gonna stay or go. Once you make the decision, it's still hard, but it's easy because you know you're doing the right thing. And I say this about women a lot. My own observation of women and people that I've talked to have been in that situation. 
We will do everything possible to fix it. We will do everything we can to remedy it, to put it back together, to glue everything, all of the pieces back that shattered. But once we're done, we're done. And I knew that I was done in that moment. I didn't know how it was going to work. I didn't know how I was going to leave safely. I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew I was going to do it. And I did. Everything worked together. I went back to therapy. I had already lined up an apartment. And we got divorced. And I spent a lot of time in this apartment by myself being quiet. I felt humiliation and shame. I think that when you're in an abusive situation, the first time something happens, you accept the apology because we love them. We want to give them the benefit of the doubt. We've seen good in them. Then it happens a second time, a third time, and every time it happens after that, you realize, but I let it happen. I let it happen again and again and again. So the bricks of shame that sit on your shoulders just get heavier and heavier and heavier with every episode, every abusive episode that happens. You know, God wants us to be who he created us to be and living in an abusive relationship is not going to create you to be the person you're supposed to be. I tell people all the time, you were not born to be abused. But God can take really horrible situations and make something really good out of them. Yes, it happened to you. It shouldn't have happened to you. But you also shouldn't let it affect the rest of your life because you don't deserve that. The other thing I realized, I realized the importance of words because of how they were used against me. I felt how they cut you. Even if they don't cut you physically, emotionally, they just can rip you to shreds if you do not use the right words, if you do not use some care and compassion. It expanded my capacity to forgive because I learned first to forgive myself. I forgave myself for allowing myself to live like that for four years because I knew that that's not what God meant for me to go through, but I knew that he was going to use it for good and he was going to pull me out of it. And therefore, it expanded my capacity to forgive other people, including my ex-husband. By the time I left, quite honestly, I had forgiven him. I just knew I wasn't safe with him. And I learned you can forgive somebody and still set that boundary. It also renewed my true belief in second chances. And we will never run out of chances with God. Even if we screw up again and again and again and again, God is there every single time to just hold our hands and pick us up and say, let's try this again together. My mom gave me Jesus Calling several years ago. I was just in a horrible place. And I always say Jesus Calling transformed my life. I needed to hear God speak to me the way Sarah writes his words. It helped me remember my worth. Because even though what I came from and I had all those experiences that made me question my worth, and you think, oh, I've gone through this therapy and I've gotten through so much of it, it still pops up. They never go away. So Jesus Calling has probably been one of the most gifted books I have ever given to people. I just hand it out because it transformed my life. And I hope that it does for other people too, because I think it gives us a very different voice, a new voice, a very personal voice between our hearts and Jesus's words. This is a passage from Jesus Always, January 26th. Relax, my child. I'm in control. Let these words wash over you repeatedly like soothing waves on a beautiful beach, assuring you of my endless love. You waste a lot of time and energy 
trying to figure out things before their time has come. Meanwhile, I'm working to prepare the way before you. So be on the lookout for some wonderful surprises, circumstances that only I could have orchestrated. Remember that you are my beloved. I am on your side and I want what's best for you. Someone who is loved by a generous, powerful person can expect to receive an abundance of blessings. You are loved by the king of the universe and I have good plans for you. As you look ahead into the unknown future, relax in the knowledge of who you are, the one I love. Cling to my hand and go forward with confidence. While you and I walk together along the path of life, your trust in me will fill your heart with joy and your mind with peace. This verse speaks to everything that I have gone through and sometimes things that I still do. One of the words that stuck with me when I first read it was, go forward with confidence. I don't always have confidence. None of us do. But to know that I could have confidence in God and that God is for us, that He pursues us, that He loves us, that He's not judging us 24-7 like everybody on social media does. It gave me the confidence to remember, as it says in the beginning, that He's in control and that if I give it to Him, we are worthy of expecting abundance of blessings. We don't trust ourselves. Coming out of something like that, we don't trust ourselves to make a sound decision. But I learned that a healthy relationship will never require you to sacrifice your friends or your dreams or your dignity. And I just want everybody to know God is for you. We find the strength to be transparent and share our stories. We can help each other get through it. This is not about me. This is about God telling people, you are worth it. I am for you. Just trust me. You can find Christy Paul's book, Love Isn't Supposed to Hurt, wherever you buy books. Stay tuned to Glow Atonmo's story after a brief message. Many of us want to develop a deeper prayer life. In this new 365-day devotional, Jesus Listens, Sarah Young offers daily prayers based on Scripture that will help you experience how intentional prayer can connect you to God and change your heart. Learn more about Jesus Listens and download a free sample at jesuscalling.com slash jesuslistens. Our next guest is travel blogger Gloa Tonmo, who built a career for herself traveling the world solo and blogging about it. But earlier this year, Glow faced a medical trauma that was horrific and painful, and she found herself wondering if she would ever find her sense of self or purpose again. Through her recovery, Glow was inspired to return to work in a different way, her voice strengthened by her suffering and her purpose resolute to help others find healing beyond their own traumatic situations. Hey everyone, so my name is Glow Atanmo and I'm a social educator, a travel blogger, a business coach, and a content creator. And I've basically built a living online for the last 20 years being in digital media. <laughs> I am a daughter of two Nigerian immigrant parents, but I was born and raised in California. And I think having that duality of growing up in a home where it was very Nigerian in the home, but I would go to school and it was very American. And I felt like at a young age, I constantly had to like straddle between two lanes and two identities of am I Nigerian or am I more American? And which one do I belong to? And am I doing American right? Am I doing Nigerian right? And I constantly fought for belonging and not only with, you know, career and entrepreneurship, but just identity and like, where do I belong? And so I think that helped me shape my identity growing up and feeling like I was a lot more observant, more observant than others at a younger age, because I never belonged and I never had like a friend, a core friend circle. And so I had to find that belonging within myself. And of course, my dad being a pastor, um, raised in the church as well. So it, it's been an interesting childhood, but I look back on those years now and I'm like, wow, I'm so thankful that God allowed me, and I say allow because it's just 
in the moment we feel like, oh, I just want to fit in and I feel so cursed, but God allowed me to go through that experience so that I could have this level of awareness and wisdom now in my adult years. And I come from a very traditional background where it's like you're a doctor, a lawyer, or a disappointment. And you know, my, my parents were very clear about like, we have immigrated to this country to give you guys an opportunity to be doctors and lawyers. Don't disappoint us. And that was like over my head, looming over my head. And I, I would have those conversations with my mom and I would see her disappointment and hear her disappointment. And I would just say, just give me one more year, one more year. And I, I made it a, a point to never ask her for money. So like the days where I didn't have money to feed myself, I'm like, I'm not asking her for anything because if she knows how much I'm failing, <laughs> she'll use this against me forever. <laughs> so I, I was like, I have to figure it out. I have no other choice. I'm thankful that I always kind of lived below the poverty line till I was about 25. I'm thankful that I never had means because when you're living well and you have enough finances, failure is terrifying because it's like you are presented with the real reality of like, I might not be able to pay my bills. I might not be able to take care of myself. I've really never been able to <laughs> take care of myself. I literally left the US with $500 in my bank account, no savings. Like I, I booked a one-way ticket to the UK and I was like, I'm gonna make this work. It's do or do, succeed or succeed. I never gave myself a plan B and that gave me such a relentlessness to be like, go figure it out. And yes, I went days without eating. At my lowest, I slept on a park bench because I couldn't afford a hostel or a hotel for the night. I got into entrepreneurship first through blogging. So I started my first blog at 11 years old and my travel blog was my sixth blog. And that was the one that really took off. I allowed myself to learn and develop what my thing was gonna be as I experimented. So I did, I had a pop culture blog, I had a music blog, I had a sports blog, I had an academic blog. I knew that I loved to write and I knew I had a powerful voice. I just didn't know how I was gonna use that voice yet. And then when I was presented the opportunity to study abroad, I was like, whoa, I could tell stories of the world. And that felt so impactful and powerful to me. So for seven years, I was a full-time travel blogger, 80 countries across six continents. And that was my life. I was just, I felt like I was living the dream, like on cloud nine, like I've made it, like a multiple six-figure blog, getting paid to travel, like this is it. All right, God, well, I can just, you know, and I think when I look back on that journey, I think it was that moment where I, I stopped giving the glory and the honor and the praise to God. I got so full of my own skills and what I accomplished and oh, Glow, you're just, you're killing it, girl. Like, you know, and you forget who qualified you, who gave you the opportunities and the blessings Sometimes God needs to humble you to remind you as quickly as I give, I can take. And if you forget who is giving you these opportunities and what this is all for, like never get to a place of pride where you feel like you're untouchable. And I feel like with travel blogging, I got there and it was, it was so humbling and sad. You know, I look back on that. I was like, man, I, I really built up this, just my ego was just come on. I mean, and you're, you're getting paid to travel and you're living this really luxurious life. It goes right to your head. And at the height of my career, I'm just like landing these five and six figure brand deals. I'm being flown around the world. I'm just living on cloud nine. I feel untouchable. And I'm just, you know, things are easy and it's just, you know, living my life. I end up in Malta for an, a friend's event, um, a video event celebration. And I remember over the last like over the last year, I had felt stomach pain. And again, when you have so much pride, you are almost afraid to learn what's wrong with you because you don't want anything to stop you from your dream life. And I was like, okay, I feel the pain, but it's sporadic enough to where I can ignore it. I'm just gonna pretend, I'm gonna let it heal itself. I would just, you know, I, I remember cutting out, like with my diet, I just cut out bread, I cut out gluten, I became a vegetarian, I stopped eating meat. I was like, I'm gonna let my body heal itself. I don't know what's going on, but I'm just gonna hope it heals itself. So I was like losing all this weight because I was on a dinosaur diet, like eating leaves and tomatoes. <laughs> but I still had this massive bulge on my stomach and I was like, this is, it's concerning. It, it, it was getting bad, but again, pride. I was like, nope. 
whatever it is, you're not gonna stop me from travel. Like, I, I don't know what it is, but I'm just gonna ignore it enough to it's gonna go away on its own. Until finally, it was about early February and excruciating pain. I literally felt like my, my organs were just being like, just squeezed and just, it was so painful. It was such a sharp pain. And I'm like crying out. I'm just like, ah, like it's, it's too much. And I'm like, I can't, this is enough. I, I've got to get it checked out. I, I rushed myself to the hospital in Malta. And of course, immediately the doctor's like, if I didn't know any better, I would, I would think you were eight months pregnant. Like what, how, how have you been? And, you know, and so in that moment, of course, I'm just emotional. The fact that you have this doctor who's delirious saying like, how could you let it get this bad? And immediately we do, there's about 21 or 26, I don't remember the exact number, blood tests on the spot. So I'm being pricked and poked and just all of these things we do in ultrasound to get like a deeper look. And that's when they diagnose, this is an ovarian cyst. And right now, like your organs are so moved out of place that they showed me the scan. They're like, you, all of your organs are being pushed out of place and you have just, it's growing and right, you know, if you feel pain, it's because, you know, it could have ruptured, you know, and, and they're showing we have to do an emergency operation. And so we're, we're, we're just going through the process and it's just like, it's just so much. And they're asking me questions. And it, of course, again, I'm in Malta. There's a little bit of a, a language barrier to speak English, but there was still, you know, accent and they were speaking so fast. And they're just telling me like, what's your insurance like? You know, if things don't work out, like, you know, transporting the body like what what and they're just it became so real in that moment and of course all i can think about is how stupid could i have been to just think that i was bigger than a, a whole issue growing in my body and you know to fast forward the the operation thankfully seven hours of operation everything went well and i'm i'm in the hospital recovering and then about a week later i'm back in my apartment and i just remember feeling so first of all i, I they put me on a no-fly list for eight weeks they're like bed rest you're not going anywhere. Like we need to be checking up on you. You are stuck. And so I immediately have to cancel these different jobs that I had lined up after Malta. And so of course, financially, I'm like, oh my goodness. So I feel, I felt financially depleted. So I'm just feeling so drained physically, mentally, emotionally, financially. And I remember having so much of my identity was placed in my ability to travel. And for eight weeks, I felt like, who am I? If I can't travel and I can't post, like this was what, this is what I'm known for. Who am I anymore? Like I felt so useless. And I really want to speak to the person who, who puts so much self-worth in their label, like don't do that. Your self-worth comes from God alone because I had put so much of my self-worth and identity in travel. So when travel was taken away from me and I'm like reteaching myself how to walk, like I was literally bent over for so many days, like teaching myself how to walk again and just relearning functioning of my organs. It was just so traumatic that I remember like I was looking at the painkillers and I'm like, why am I here anymore? I have nothing left. I don't want to be here anymore. And I just, I'm tired. And I like, God, I, I'm sorry. I've disappointed you, my audience. I've disappointed them. I know I have friends that I can call, but sometimes when you're drugged up, you're not in your right mind. You know, all, I'm taking painkillers constantly. I'm not in my right state and I'm by myself. And I'm just like, I'm, I don't have any strength to carry on. And in that moment, you don't think about your friends and your family that you're going to hurt. You just think about escaping the pain because you can't run away from it's when you're mentally it's a mental prison you can't run away from that and you just want to escape that mental pain and I remember looking at the Jesus calling devotional and I was like this is all I have and I turned to the page the February 16th I just needed that I just needed that that quick confirmation that there's a purpose in this that God is is, is putting me through this humbling season for a reason and it was so, so powerful. And I, again, I'll, I'll never, you know, Sarah Young, I'll never truly be able to thank her for saving my life. Because reading that, I just needed to know that there was purpose in my pain. Because when you're going through a really dark moment, you don't see an escape. All The only escape sometimes is, is ending everything. And, and I was so close to that. And I just needed something, something to, to validate, like, gloat, there's something else is going to come out of this. 
So I look back on that moment and I just thank God so much for putting me through that, that humbling season. Because on the other side of that, I had such a new approach to life. I, I dedicated, everything that I did was about serving other people. It was no longer about me. I, I don't care about what I can do for myself. How can I help the world? How can I heal the world? How can I speak to those who are also going through a traumatic experience? And it, it, it's so incredible how God will use seasons of, of pain to really set you up for your next season of elevation. And that was, that was what that was. So I stayed put for about three months. I allowed myself to kind of like, I healed, of course. And when I was taken off the no-fly list, I remember my friend was like, hey, Glow, there's a conference going on. It's all the way in Arizona. So it it would take about 38 hours of connections (laughs) to fly back. And when you're transitioning, of course, all this time, I'm not even on social media. So I've been gone, you know, it's like two months. And so people are emailing, DMing, Glow, are you okay? Like, what's going on? So I'm like, oh, I've got to I've got to say something. I can't just hide. And so I decide to share the blog post that to this day has gotten like, gosh, over 100,000 views. I get emails weekly, like, I have an ovarian cyst and I didn't know anyone else dealing with this. And, you know, people telling me their story. But my friend, Samantha, she told me about, this conference called High Performance Academy in Arizona. And I needed something to kind of rebuild me. Like I was, you know, going back on my my spiritual walk and and building up my self-worth again, but I still needed something to be in a community of people who, again, were using their platforms for good. And so going to this High Performance Academy, it was like a three, four day event. And it was a room of just positive, empowering leaders who want to do good in the world. And it was such a great segue into like, okay, I'm recommitting and rededicating my life to something bigger than me. And that's when I kind of like dissolved my travel influencing career and started creating programs that just were all about teaching, like launching my first course, launching my first coaching program, launching my first retreat company, just like, how can I help? How can I teach? How can I serve? And really becoming like a teacher instead of just an influencer. Like now I'm a teacher, everything that I've learned through even the painful periods, like how can I now teach this and help and save other people? Travel will always be available to me and it's still such a massive privilege. And I think the way that I show up in the world now feels so much more fulfilling because when you have purpose and legacy behind what you do, you you feel more called and led in your work. And who I was in my 20s, I wasn't ready to serve the way I do now. Like I, I was figuring out my own life. You know, and you have to heal yourself before you can try to heal and help others. So I believe that I've done (laughs) travel blogging to the extent that I needed to, but I feel so fulfilled in the lane that I'm in now. And I think just reminding people of that, like, hey, I'm constantly a student, which is what makes me a great teacher because I'm never above people. I'm just like addicted to like learning (laughs) because I, I love to feel I'm treating people to the best of my ability and knowing the right language and words and understanding. And yeah, communication and and words is at the core of everything I do. Like, And if we can be more intentional with the way we use our words and how we deliver them and how we pour into people with them, we're literally delivering healing to other people. To learn more about GLOW, please visit theblogabroad.com. If you'd like to hear more stories where God helps someone find a way out of a desperate situation, check out our interview with Lathan Warlick. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we'll talk with three people with special connections to the Samaritan's Purse Project, Operation Christmas Child, which collects shoebox gifts filled with toys, school supplies, hygiene items and delivers them to children in need around the world to demonstrate God's love in a tangible way. My name is Vladimir Viktorovich Praknevsky, and uh, I am a shoebox recipient from Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child. I received a beautiful and colorful shoebox from Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child when I was only nine years old. And let me tell you what a blessing that was, not only for myself, but also for the whole family. And for me, it was extra special because it was my first Christmas gift ever. But most importantly, the gospel came with it. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? 
Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com Jesus Calling Book on Facebook and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.